Hello, everyone, and welcome to the iForest Global Webinar. I'm Mary McGrogan, iForest Secretary. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to just review a few housekeeping notes. All questions will be answered after all four speakers have completed their presentations. Please use the Q&A button uh, to direct questions to the speakers. Your name will automatically show up, um, but in the box, please indicate which speaker your question is for, followed by your question. Um, you may use the chat feature to communicate with all of the other attendees. I don't think that you have one-on-one -on -one communication capability, but you should be able to uh, say hello to all of the other attendees. And uh, now I'd like to pass it over to our I4's past president, Michael Trick, uh, who will kick off the webinar. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so as Mary said, my name is Michael Trick. I am the past president of i and will be so for the next six weeks until my term finally ends. Um, it is uh, uh, wonderful uh, to be involved with i and I am very pleased to be hosting today's global webinar on global sports analytics. Uh, the moderator today will be Fritz uh, Spieksma, who is the incoming i vice president. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I did want to say a few words about i i of course, stands for the International Federation of Operational Research Societies. We are an unusual grouping because we are a society of societies. The members of i are the various countries, societies. So INFORMS, representing the United States, is a member of i as is CORS for Canada, the various European uh, countries, and countries all around the world. In fact, 40, uh, 54 of them. Uh, these are divided into four regional groupings, NORAM for North America, ALIO for South America, APORS for Asia Pacific, um, and um, Euro for Europe. And well, we hope someday that AFROS uh, will be representing our various African member societies. Next slide, please. Um, the i uh, is has uh, been organized uh, through its administrative committee, um, and this is the group that decided that the webinar series would be a good thing to be doing. Our current president is Grazia Speranza, and you can see the names of the other people who are working hard for i -Force. Next slide, please. Um, this is, um, I think, number eight of our, of our uh, global webinars. And so we have had global webinars sponsored by each of the regional societies. We've had a webinar on gender diversity. We've had a webinar on the ITOR best papers. And the best part of this, all of these uh, webinars are available. And so you can uh, look at some of the past presentations and they're all really fascinating. I highly recommend them to you. Next slide, please. So. Without further ado, I think it is time for us to get on to today's global webinar, OR in Practice, Global Sports Analytics. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Fritz Spixma, your moderator for today. Fritz? Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, welcome to everybody who is, uh, who is here. I'm going to uh, make it short and uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of our webinar, Elizabeth Wanless. Elizabeth is an assistant professor at the College of Business of Ohio University. Not only has she made impressive scientific contributions in the intersections of sports analytics and data science, she is also an accomplished athlete, having participated in the World Championships shot put competition. So who is better placed than to start off as a first speaker in our webinar of today? At least I'm going to be all ears for her presentation. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction, Fritz, and thank you to our global audience. I have to say, I am so glad to be here, already seeing comments in the chat from around the globe. So welcome to my presentation entitled NLP Diffusion in North American Professional Sport. I join you from Athens, Ohio, this little snippet of where I am at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. 
as Fritz stated, I'm the assistant director of analytics, but I'm also the president of Informed Sports. To say that I am a sport analytics enthusiast uh, is an understatement. So I hope this only means that the conversation will continue. This is a research project that I've conducted and is now published in Sport Management Review. I'm glad to share it with you because it was one of those special research projects where you thought you would find something and you found something entirely different. So I was completely surprised by the results of this study. To get started, uh, we're all here for a reason. We're interested in the sport industry and the way analytics is applied because the sport industry is inundated with innovation. My particular interest was noticing these an this anecdotal evidence that text data and the evaluation and assessment of text data was on the rise. I knew that the, the value of text data just jumps off the page. You have customer interactions online, online reviews, but even in terms of the internal aspects of an organization, text data is valuable. Think about sales transcripts and evaluating those conversations that sales reps have with customers. So knowing the value of text data, knowing there's an, uh, anecdotal evidence of adoption of natural language processing in the North American professional sport industry, there was a lot I thought we could uncover. What do we really know about this? I thought it would be in its infancy. Turns out it was not. So I set forth with the rec these research questions and I think frame the presentation well. So what are the potential natural language processing use cases for sport business? How do professional sport teams invest in natural language processing? And what is the predicted natural language processing diffusion in professional sport? Again, I thought this was something that might be in its infancy with very few use cases. But again, it turns out I would be in for a surprise. If you set out on a literature review for natural language processing, be prepared. There's over 65,000 pieces of trade and academic literature to sift through. And just like there's a gap, in analytics conversations, meaning sometimes the highly technical and trade uh, individuals have a difficult time relating to each other. I found the same with the literature that was present, that it was either, either highly technical and academic in nature, meaning it was investigating these natural language processing algorithms and advancing those algorithms, or they were isolated trade cases where you know, you were discussing the value of Conversica's chatbot, for example. So understanding the use cases for the sport industry involved an integrative literature review that I'll talk about in the methods section. Diffusion of innovations theory guided this investigation. And in short, the adoption within an industry is a process, meaning it's not all happening at once. And there's a lot to learn from studying how that adoption happens. If I can direct your attention to the right, it's important to keep this yellow line in mind as we work through the presentation. This yellow line represents the, what is traditionally known as the S-curve, the shape that cumulative, cumulative adoptions take within a market or an industry. The blue line would be the actual adoptions. And you can see that the individuals who are first or businesses that are first to adopt something would be considered the innovators, progressing through the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and then finally the laggards. So where did I think the sport, professional sport industry in North America would be? Right here, right in the innovators portion. I'll run through the methods so that you have an idea of the methodological progression because the study took on quite a bit of life as I realized the conversation surrounding natural language processing for sport needed some norms. You know, how do you even ask these professional sport teams about what they're doing for natural language processing if you're not sure even how to level set the conversation? So to begin on the left here, we started with the 123 professional sport teams in the big four, the NFL, 
the NHL, the MLB, and the NBA. In order to even ask the questions that we wanted to ask, we needed to create a natural language processing use cases taxonomy. That missing piece of the conversation that I was talking about, a comprehensive overview of what natural language processing could do for sport business so that I could ask these professionals how they used it. So I conducted an integrative literature review. I did have to narrow from the 65,000 <laughs> from the 65,000 literature pieces down to roughly 80 on both the trade and natural language processing side. And the systematic overviews of natural language processing in different disciplines were where I found most use in terms of the literature to inform this study. The survey was comprised of organizational demographic questions. When these, when these teams adopted natural language processing to evaluate text data, and then how they used these uh, natural language processing algorithms to advance sport business. So the analysis involved descriptive statistics and a discrete best model forecast with nonlinear least squares optimization. You know, the best model has been around for quite some time since the seminal paper in 1969 by Bass and has worked quite well in this case. I did have to adapt the model for the discrete environment and wanted to show the outline of the equations that informed this particular study. So the first two have to do with the portion of the market that had adopted up to and including time, adopted up to and including time T for the discrete environment. The second was a portion of the market that adopts at time T and to follow cumulative adoptions and annual adoptions were expressed by multiplying those equations by the market. Now, we were in a really good spot for this analysis because we didn't have to estimate the market like so many of these uh, investigations do. For example, if you want to know how well iPhones will diffuse through a given market, it may mean the estimation of how many customers will inevitably adopt. In this case, we estimated to the sample, 91 teams, uh, 123 teams were sought 91 teams actually filled out the survey. So I have the uh, parameters in red. We didn't have to estimate M, but we did estimate P and Q and they have special meaning. So P is the coefficient of innovation. Gives us an idea of those pattern, the pattern of the innovators. Q on the other hand is the coefficient of imitation. Gives, gives us an idea of the pattern of those imitating those individuals who were first to adopt. So let me move my slide. I have the participants here to show the types of data that we collected. The columns are indicative of that. The number of teams, the region in which they existed, the number of business analytics staff, business whether they in-house and outsourced business analytics, if they, how they invested up until May 2020, I should say at this point that for the analysis, we used a complete timestamp, which was 2019. We collected this data during the pandemic. So along with collecting this data for natural language processing were very interesting conversations with sport organizations and how they were adopting, uh, excuse me, how they were adapting to the pandemic during this time. And then if they outsourced or in-house uh, natural language processing. But I wanted to draw your attention to specific aspects of this table. So first on the left, we had a wonderfully representative sample. Individuals were ready to chat during this, during this time of pandemic when I thought maybe they wouldn't be. So we had 73% of the MLB teams represented, 76% of the NBA teams, 68% of the NFL teams, and 77% of the NHL team. So nice snapshot. And I think particularly relevant are these, you know, this third to last and last columns here is the readily, the team's readily in-house business analytics operations. But you'll see quite a few more teams outsource these operations for natural language processing. And I think that that has to do with the sophistication of natural language processing algorithms, but also the incorporation of chatbots, which would be a 
a fundamental use case for professional sport business uh, in terms of natural language processing. So what did we come up with? The NLP taxonomy had six domains where natural language processing was harnessed to analyze text data regarding customer relationships, the organization itself, and organizations' partnerships, competitors, the sport industry, and then the sport experience, meaning a lot of those that fell within the sport experience were real time. Most of the declared uses were in customer relationships, as you would suspect, that immediate return on investment was what a lot of teams declared uh, very important to adopting natural language processing. And so advancing customer re relationships and that revenue generating aspect was pretty important. Also the trend for use of chatbots sentiment analysis became very important as well. Here's what surprised me. 48 teams of the sample had adopted natural language processing by the mid May to 2020. So that's over half. Now this is not a situation where we are at the innovation stage of sport business adopting uh, this, tech, this capability. Declared 334 unique natural language processing uses throughout the six domains. So this is something that is very compatible with sport business and is already widely used in different ways. Each subdimension, sub and these numbers here below these categories represent the subdimensions, each subdimension received on average 5.21 reports from these different teams. But there were predominant use cases in automated customer interactions, like I said, the chatbot, uh, 63 declarations in various areas, meaning some use a chatbot for customer uh, relationships, some used it for the sport experience, and so that's why you see that number at 63. And then sentiment analysis, which is just has been a popular way to understand how customers are viewing what, what we're doing. And then media monitor, monitoring and social listening came in third, is that if there's a public narrative about our sport business, we kind of want to know what it is. And you'll see that, that, that the natural language processing was used for media monitoring throughout uh, customer relationships understanding how the organization was perceived, understanding organization partnerships. And so a really interesting story was the new way to value or to assess sport agents in this realm, that if you wanted to know whether your sport agent had a positive or negative reputation, that natural language processing was a way to assess their reputation across the public narrative. So just really interesting use cases throughout sport business. I wanted to give a snapshot of how this looked, the taxonomy and you know, these use cases, you know, what they ended up looking like and how the numbers were reported. So topic classification, media monitoring, consumer segmentation, influencer identification, language translation, automated customer service and targeting leads. I mean, the use cases abound in the sport industry. And again, I was, I was quite surprised by that. So in the analysis, if I can direct your attention to the left, you have the uh, actual adoptions annually. And you can see that this, this early start date, right, at 2010, which was interesting, you know, culminating as to what the model predicted might be a peak in 2019, 2020, which was, uh, again, interesting to me. On the right, we have the cumulative adoption model with the competence interval bands surrounding. You know, if a couple of years had passed and we had moved past this inflection point, I feel as though we may have more information on this analysis as to what this trajectory might look like toward the, toward the end, toward full saturation. But in terms of how it was able to fit the first 10 years of natural language processing adoption, the the root mean squared error and the mean absolute error hovered right around one. So that was a nice feature of this analysis to be able to fit so well. So the results include a P, a coefficient of 0 0.003 and Q of 0 0.428. And this has uh, interesting results. The sport industry is known for being quick to, to adopt analytics on the player side. 
and very slow to adopt and to adopt these types of technologies on the business side. This is evidence of that as this P would be considered below average, the coefficient of innovation would be considered below average and the coefficient of imitation would be considered above. So this uh, would be a slower trajectory to get started toward that full saturation. Imagine your sport business operations as having full adoption, at least in the North, North American professional leagues, as having full adoption by 2031. It's closer than we think. This, the use cases of natural language processing are wider than we think, and it's happening, uh, although slow pace for adoption of innovations in general, it's happening faster than we think. So sport business is evolving. And I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to share this analysis with you today and the I4's global audience. I look forward to questions in our, at the end of our panel. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I think it's a fascinating story about uh, the rate of adoption of this uh, natural language processing in the, in the major sports. It's very nice to hear. And I can well imagine the audience having questions. They will have to wait a little bit because we are going to uh, uh, over to our second speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie Kowalczyk. Uh, she holds a PhD from UCLA in statistics slash data science. One of her current interests at least is having had a previous appointment at uh, Tennis Australia, for instance, tennis analytics and I know that she has a particular interest uh, in the mental side of, uh, of the game which I which is an interest that I share. Okay Stephanie I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Please take it away. Thank you Fritz and uh, welcome to um, all of the participants today. Um, first I wanted to thank the organizers of today's panel for the opportunity to participate in a discussion on sports analytics, uh, global sports analytics, which has been my passion for over a decade now. One of the things I love about technical conferences and webinars like we're having here is how we can get into the fine grained details of the work that we do. Uh, but in focusing on the technical nitty gritty of our work, we don't always get the chance to talk about the broader systems and organizations in which that work happens and how it shapes the actual work itself. Uh, so I wanted to use some of my time today to take a step back and talk about a new business model for research and development in the sports industry. I became personally aware of this model when I joined Zealous Analytics at the start of 2020. At Zealous, we've taken a unique approach to delivering data science to pro sports that has exciting potential for research innovation in sport. And I think our difference is something that will be of interest to sports researchers. So I wanted to take my time uh, to give you an overview of the Zealous model. So what exactly is Zealous all about and what makes it unique? First, we're a third party service that provides access to an analytics platform to pro sports. As an external entity, we aren't tied to any one team or any one sport. And this is a really important distinction because it gives us the ability to provide related solutions to potentially multiple teams and multiple sports. Currently, our team's nearly 40 highly trained research scientists that represent an, about an even split of data science and data engineering. Altogether, those numbers mean that we have more collective talent than most pro leagues. We also put a high priority on rigorous academic and industry experience, which is reflected in our co-founders, Doug Fearing and Luke Bourne who both hold PhDs in technical fields, were former tenure track faculty at Harvard, and both have experience building R&D departments for sports teams. Mm -hmm. 
why are these characteristics important? Well, we think a highly resourced, technically experienced team is what's needed to meet the demands of performance evaluation in modern sport. So I'm sure you're all aware that we've been firmly in the money ball era of sports analysis for nearly two decades. And during that time, the complexity of data and the investment in analytics has only continued to grow with each year. And the reality is that the personnel on sports teams just aren't equipped to handle the challenges that modern data presents, both in terms of the scale and complexity of the kind of data um, that's become the cutting edge in sport, including tracking data and other emerging data technologies. But surprisingly, sports teams haven't seemed to recognize this because when we look at how they've tried to actually capitalize on the potential of sports data science, they've taken um, by and large an in-house siloed approach. This means that teams have recruited dedicated staff to focus on advanced performance analysis. So it's a within house team that's only accessible to that team but that, although the exclusivity that that sort of design uh, provides can be appealing, it does have significant cost. So these silos are for one expensive and usually lead to shortcuts either in the numbers of the talent that's hired or the quality of the talent itself. Further, the decentralization and secrecy surrounding these silos mean that it's difficult for teams to assess how the quality of their data science staff and its output compares to other teams, creating highly uncertain ROI for the investments that they're making. The siloed model means that huge redundancies and inefficiencies exist in data science and data engineering work that's currently conducted within the sports industry. And one of the contributing factors to this is that existing third party vendors have tended to focus more on data capture and don't really provide sufficient depth and analytics to provide a real competitive advantage to teams. We can see the breadth versus depth dilemma when we consider some of the major vendors that currently exist in sport, including companies like Second Spectrum, Stats, and Sports Radar. I mean, the heavy contribution that these companies make is providing new or more comprehensive sources of data. And you will find some analytic services, but they tend to be more descriptive in nature or to the extent that any modeling is done, it's at a quite basic level, just because um, their focus, their business focus is so um, stretched in multiple directions. So Zealous has used this third party model but dedicated it to the building of analytic services for complex performance questions, like the valuation of individual players and their projected value over time. The building of each sport platform that we create involves a well-defined process um, that's outlined here. And it goes from the ingestion of raw data from data vendors for a given sports league to the creation of data-driven decision-making tools. Importantly, the solutions that we're creating have potential value to all teams because all of them are interested in these very same questions. And we take advantage of the division conference structure that exists in sports leagues to provide access to multiple teams, um, access to our platforms across multiple teams at any one time. So this gives a significant advantage from the team point of view to tap into the kind of analytical resources that we can provide, but that would be too expensive for them to be able to build 
themselves from the ground up, even though that's what historically they've been trying to do. Our model development and the delivery of services to teams all happen within the use of cloud-based services. This is important for meeting the increasing scale of the data sets that we're seeing in pro sport, as well as ensuring the robustness of the services that we provide. And crucially, the infrastructure we've developed is directly transferable to other sports. And what this allows us um, this kind of transferable uh, data structure allows us to accelerate the delivery of data science tools to sports. Um, well, really any sport, but particularly in areas where the use of complex data sets and analysis may only just be emerging. So I hope that in giving this overview of the zealous business structure, I have shown the opportunity that exists for third party analytic services in sport and how this approach can foster deeper and more valuable model development within the sports industry. Um, I know this has been a very broad intro, but I hope during our Q&A that I'll be able to go into um, more detail um, depending on the entrance of uh, our participants. So thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Stephanie, for, uh, for sharing your story about, um, well, I guess where, where uh, sport analytics came from and where, where you see that there is a, a potential for, for applying it more from, uh, from the perspective that you sketch. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Again, uh, I'm, I repeat, if you have questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A uh, button and we'll come back to that after all our speakers uh, have given their presentation. So I'm now going to introduce the third speaker of this session. Um, Dimitri is an associate professor at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He has a wide variety of interests ranging from social choice to the economics of sports if I'm not mistaken, but Dimitri, you will correct me if I say something wrong. You are also responsible for the schedule of the Russian soccer league. Uh, in any case, I'm looking forward to a, to a nice presentation. Dimitri, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Fritz. Uh, thank you to all organizers of this event. It's an uh, honor for me to be a speaker here. And today I'm going to talk about the story of the laboratory of sports studies. I'm going to talk about scheduling the Russian Premier League, as you already said. And it is uh, my talk will not be about the models itself. I will talk about our attempts to uh, enter the market to uh, apply our knowledge of operations research methods to solve real world problems, okay? So our laboratory uh, was established three years ago at the Faculty of Economic Sciences at HEC University. And we are uh, nearly 25 uh, researchers. Most of them are students of bachelor, masters and PhD levels. Uh, and several senior colleagues work uh, in our laboratory as well. And we uh, perform some theoretical research and data analysis in various sports related uh, problems. Uh, our main goal is to provide our students the opportunity to work on their first research projects. And I hope that it will help them to consider the academic career in the near future. Uh, another goal of our laboratory is to organize the platform here in Russia for cooperation between the researchers and the sports industry. And I will be talking about this last point today. So uh, at the very beginning, three years ago, we made several unsuccessful attempts 
uh, to cooperate with the industry. Uh, at the very beginning, we approached one of the second tier football clubs in Russia, and we talked to one of the top managers of the club, and we said, okay, we can do this, that, that, uh, we can uh, help you to increase the probability of winning in a separate match, we can help you to improve the financial performance of the club. And uh, the manager looked at us, uh, thought for several seconds, and then he said, well, guys, you are good, but our head coach has 30 years of experience and he knows everything what to do without all these numbers, graphs, and so on. So he will not listen to me or to you when you will show him why this player should play today or should not play today. He will not listen to you when you will give an advice to a player where to shoot the penalty kick. No. So the, this approach was unsuccessful. Okay, we came to another club. Uh, this time it was a first tire football club. And we told them once again, okay, we can do this, this, and this. Uh, we can help you to increase the probability of winning. We can help you to improve the financial performance. And this time the manager said, okay, yeah, those plans are fascinating. And we are very interested in achieving these goals. However, we won't give you the data. We are afraid that these data will uh, leak to the market and we just don't want that. Uh, so no data, no results. Okay. Next time we approached one of uh, sports federations and we said to them the same things. We can do this, this and that. And uh, they replied that we are very interested in that. However, uh, we don't think that it costs some money. So can you do this for us free of charge? And well, the cooperation didn't happen this time as well. And well, we thought about the reasons why it all went wrong. And it seems that there are several different reasons. One of them is that the market was just not ready for the extensive use of data analytics. Because it seems that here in Russia, we are 10 years late or so compared to the Western sports market. And only the leaders of the market today begin to hire data scientists and the holders of PhD degree in statistics and operations research and uh, related uh, fields of study. Uh, second, it seems that without the reputation, it is difficult to negotiate with the clubs, with the federations, because without having some successfully implemented projects, uh, well, the clubs just uh, are not sure, will you be able to complete the project? And finally, it seems that our main mistake was that we didn't ask the clubs and we didn't ask the federations, what do they need? And this was our major fault. So we decided to change the strategy and uh, look for the major drawbacks in the competitions, in the market. And uh, we decided to try to uh, deal with those drawbacks. And uh, at the same time, we decided to increase our media coverage. We started to deliver uh, SIPOP lectures and give interviews on TV uh, related to some sports events, even if, well, operations research is not uh, considered in uh, the context of this interview. 
And uh, at the same time, we asked the clubs and asked the federations, what do they need? And we decided that it is a good idea to start from a couple of free of charge, medium difficulty projects in order to improve our reputation and uh, become uh, a new player on the market. Okay, so our first successful project is indeed the pro our joint project with the Russian Premier League uh, in 90, uh, sorry, in 2019, uh, we approached our colleagues and before 2019, the schedule was created based on, based on the standard circle method with just slight modifications. And it happened that um, some games were played in severe conditions. Uh, for example, uh, in December, there were several matches in the cities of Euro, in Yekaterinburg and other cities. And due to this fact, the schedule was heavily criticized by fans, media and politicians. Uh, because, well, nobody wants to come to such matches and the players just suffer on the field. And we contacted the league and explained how the schedule can be adjusted for that. And uh, dozens of other new conditions were also taken into account, including the climate conditions, the arena restrictions, the preferences of the main broadcaster, also, the league asked us to make some adjustments for the clubs that represent Russia in European competitions in order to help to perform uh, in a better way. And uh, we said, okay, we can do all of that. And well, it took only two months to uh, sign a contract and to uh, develop a better clever schedule for the Russian Premier League. Now we have a three years contract and I hope that we will sign a new contract soon. So after that, the reactions in media uh, were very positive and uh, the laboratory attracted a lot of attention and we were shortly approached by several other Russian sports federations and they asked us uh, to help with the calendar and with other problems. And our second successful project was a joint project with the Russian Football Union. Um, the Russian Football Union was also heavily criticized uh, due to the poor performance of referees. And this attack, these attacks occurred after each poor performance of course, operational research methods cannot produce better referees. However, it seems that it is possible to make better assignments given the referees. So we approached the Russian Football Union and helped them uh, to create a recommendation system for referee assignments. We used a variant of the Gale Shapley algorithm and uh, we helped to create better uh, matchings between the matches and the referees. Of course, the key question here is how the preferences of Russian Football Union, the preferences of referees can be taken into account. And we worked with our colleagues and uh, developed uh, the system of recommendations, how to take into account each restriction, each recommendation, how to assign weights to these uh, restrictions, and at the end, the system was introduced. Okay, and finally, it seems that this Institute of Reputation worked at the end. Shortly after this project with recommendation system uh, was introduced, we were approached this time by the same football club, uh, and at the end, they asked us to develop a model for transfer market value of the players. And I think that I will uh, say a 
couple of words about this project the next time when this project will be completed. Uh, well, this is all. Uh, this is the story of our laboratory of sports studies. I will be happy to answer all comments at the end of our today's webinar. Thank you Thank to you. all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you for a very nice insight and uh, your story of uh, the challenges that you faced and uh, how you overcame this. I think that's uh, a worthwhile lesson for all of us. I can well imagine uh, questions exist. Uh, please, uh, those who have a question, type them in the Q&A and uh, we'll come back to these questions after all presentations have been given. Um, we're now moving forward to uh, our final presenter, Mario Guajardo. I met Mario, I think, in one of the most unlikely places for us to meet. I recall the Confederation Cup 2017 in Kazan in Russia. I guess Mario was there cheering for the Chilean team. And while the performance of the Chilean team team is um, sort of hidden in the midst of time, Mario's contributions to sports schedules have not been hidden in the midst of time. Uh, Mario works on round robin schedules, often with fairness objectives that, uh, that are interesting. I'm looking forward to his presentation as well. Mario, please go ahead. Thank you, Fritz, for the introduction and for the invitation here. Um, I have to say that I even have a batch for this event. Because we are, we are here in, in Norway, I, I work in the Norwegian School of Economics and ETH in Bergen, and we are hosting the Norwegian Operation Research Society Conference. It started today at lunchtime. I attend to two physical sessions after two years without physical conference for them being back here again to the online format. But of course, I'm really excited to, to have you heard the talks from the previous speaker and to share a little bit about uh, some recent developments in sports scheduling. So we'll talk about a particular application uh, that was motivated given this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, disruption into football leagues. And just before I, I go there, I just want to introduce a little bit the sports analytic groups that I've been working with. And, and I will also talk about some more, say, general uh, classical things about the uh, field. So first of all, our sports analytics group, it's uh, rooted in, in Chile. And from there, uh, we have kind of expanded the, the borders. I'm located in Norway nowadays, uh, but we also have people in Argentina and some of our uh, people have also went to USA afterwards. You just let me name uh, Guillermo Duran, Denis Saure, Anders Weintrog, Gonzalo Zamorano, and there are many others who have been part of the team. Our, our main core topic is sports scheduling, which could uh, uh, be classified more on the prescriptive uh, sides of analytics. We also have some uh, predictive and descriptive analytics applications, but the main things we have don't have to do with the scheduling. So we started scheduling the Chilean Football League in 2004. After then, uh, many of the leagues uh, uh, um, have been part of our work, and maybe the most prominent uh, one is uh, the qualifiers for the World Cup in South America. And we have also worked with the Argentinian League and since 2018, we started to work with the Equatorial League. And yeah, very recently, <laughs> we have also worked in, in leagues uh, 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 very affected by COVID-19, okay? Um, just for those who don't know uh, perhaps uh, uh, so much about the area, uh, sports scheduling, there is a, a really large body of literature. It's really exciting. There have happened many exciting things in the last uh, uh, 20 years. There are even earlier reference, but uh, I think one of the most classical and, and seminal problems in the literature has to do with the traveling tournament problem, which was uh, um, uh, um, challenging people to uh, work in algorithms. Uh, there is this website that Mike Trick uh, uh, has been hosting for many years, where there will be some data sets and then people could try uh, to improve the uh, best known solution and so on. And I think it really motivated a lot of, of, of great work. Uh, if you visit the website now, there will be this important notice, uh, last update 2020, pointing to uh, another uh, web repository called uh, Robin X. Um, here you have the reference. So David Bumble, by the way, is around here. So he's from Belgium. And, and other people in the Belgian group, they have created this really great uh, website where you will find a lot of data instances coming from real world leaks 
and 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 they even uh, organized an international timetabling competition and very recently with participation from uh, many different places around them okay um the main problem in the area um because there are many variants, but the main thing, the main decision has been scheduling matches to rounds, okay? And rounds, also call it match days, are a set of calendar dates. For example, it could be a weekend or from Friday to Sunday, or it could be a midweek date from Tuesday to Thursday, etc. So that is what we call a round. And what we will try to do then is to uh, decide which team plays against each other, in which venue, in which round of the tournament, okay? Given some format uh, and so on. And for this, you will find uh, many references, and I'm only here mentioning some about football. I know now I have to uh, add uh, with pleasure this uh, Russian new application, but there have been a lot of documented uh, implementation in practices of operation research approaches to uh, help leagues to be scheduled in better. Uh, and when it comes to solving algorithms, uh, also a classic uh, approach has been uh, trying to decompose the problem because it is a highly combinatorial. It's, it's really hard to solve the problems when you have too many conditions and, and, and there are many variables involved in, in, in the problem. And therefore, the classical approach is to decompose uh, uh, first uh, try to uh, create a set of come away patterns, meaning say, which team play at home and which team play away in every round of the tournament, and then try to create a schedule. Okay. And there are different variants for uh, uh, implementing this as well. But the, the seminal idea also come from a paper where uh, Mike was involved with Nehauser in 1998 in a college basketball scheduling. And as I say, there are many variants and, and maybe the latest of all the variants that I have seen in, 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 in something which actually was motivated in this problem that we worked with the uh, League of Argentina, was trying to go one step ahead in the sense that we will not only uh, decide whether a team plays home or away in each round, but we uh, will uh, say exactly in which, say, geo geographical cluster a team will play away when it is prescribed to play away. Okay. And, and for this, you can create different clusters. And, and in the Argentinian application, the, the natural way to create a cluster. At, was driven by some geographical conditions. And this happened to work even faster. And, and at least the Argentinian case was a, a, a better, a better approach by this uh, idea, uh, which by the way is also a generalization of the classical home away patterns, because in the worst case, we could also say that all the teams uh, are part of the same cluster. And then we are back to uh, that methodology, okay? This paper came out uh, very recently. And here you have the uh, reference. Um, but that is uh, the main problem, okay? Scheduling matches to rounds. But then, uh, especially motivated for what has been happening with the disruption of the pandemic in the sport leagues, is uh, going one step uh, forward in the problem. So, uh, scheduling matches to exit days within a round, okay? Which is somehow a secondary problem in the sense that at the beginning of the season, maybe the league officials want to just uh, uh, publish the schedule of uh, matches assigned to rounds. And maybe these dates are kind of two more uh, uh, closer to the dates when the matches will be played. But here I have an example, and, and this is why I say it's more important now that COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, disrupted in the league. So if you take a look to what happened in the Spanish league, when they tried to complete the, the league after it was resumed, you might look at some difference in the number of resting days that uh, uh, two teams facing each other will have before their match, okay? So for example, here, if you look at uh, Villarreal, play on 22nd of June, Valencia play on 25th of June on the round 31, and then the round after, they meet uh, each other on 28th of June, meaning that Villarreal had six days of rest, while uh, Valencia had uh, only three. So the difference in the resting days is three, okay? And like that, you will find other examples. And the point is that when, when the matches uh, uh, of the leagues had to be stopped because of the pandemic uh, uh, was hitting uh, in the places, then the calendar available for uh, completing the matches after the tournaments were uh, resumed uh, became much short, right? And this probably is less studied in the literature. So here you also have some uh, uh, reference. And in particular, there is some type of, uh, of scheduling problem in sports, which are called time relaxed scheduling, which match uh, 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 perfectly with this type of case. 
And yeah, since the seminar is already practice, I wanted to at least mention what we have done about this with the uh, uh, project in the Ecuadorian League. So we have been scheduling matches to round as, as usual uh, since uh, 2018. But when uh, uh, the pandemic came in 2020, then uh, in this collaboration project that we had with the uh, league officials, then it was idea what to do, how we can reschedule the matches, but now really looking at the exact dates in which they will be played, okay? And for sure, we will not have time to, to, to go through uh, mathematical formulations, but at least I wanted to mention that uh, what we're doing here is trying to minimize the difference in the resting days that the two opponents will have right before the match, okay? And in addition, the, there are many other uh, uh, requests, like for example, the, the, the recommendation of FIFA that is that all teams will rest three days before their uh, match. Uh, there are some requests from the television, like, uh, for example, the most popular team, hopefully, is, are split in different days, so the uh, uh, um, broadcasts get attractive every day. There are some security concerns, and an important point here is that the uh, schedule of matches to round is pretty finite, so uh, when we're dealing with the schedule of matches exact two days, we already know the uh, schedule of matches to round, which made the process much easier to solve in the second stage. And now, uh, very quickly, uh, I will show you some of the results that we have obtained. So uh, first of all, when we reschedule the league, um, and this happened after four uh, rounds of the tournament had already been played and some matches of the fifth round had all, all already been played. This is scheduled before the disruption of COVID and this is the one afterwards. Um, only six out of the 86 matches coincide, this is the first half of the tournament, meaning that if people would have tried to do this by hand, it would have been probably very complicated. So, uh, and I think many of the guys who have been doing practice know that when there is one or two little things that the uh, uh, managers would like to change about the schedules, then this implies changing many other things, okay? And here actually the main change that the, the, the people at the, uh, at, the, at the management of the league wanted to do was to uh, avoid trips that were too long in the uh, dates close when the uh, tournament was resumed, right? Because of all the traveling restrictions that were going on because of the pandemic. And then when we look at the resting days of the teams uh, before a match um, with this new second model that uh, uh, I, I described a little bit. So we managed to make that uh, for all the teams in all the matches, uh, there will be never less than three days off in between their matches, okay? And also we managed to make this very well, very well balanced among all the different teams, okay? So if you look, for example, at this second half of the tournament, the uh, average of the resting days of each team before a, a match are very, very close to each other. And when you look at the difference, so uh, how many days a team rests in comparison to uh, the opponent is facing on a given round. So for most of the matches, uh, we uh, got to make this different uh, equal to zero or one. Two for only three matches. In total, there were 190 matches to be played yet. And it was never more than these two days of difference, okay? And this is perceived as a fair thing by the uh, uh, people involved in the league, okay? And also what I see is that the, the league, given that uh, this uh, uh, optimization model helped to schedule matches exact on the dates that were available, uh, the league managed to complete the calendar of matches uh, within 2020, okay? Which in fact did not necessarily happen in other leagues. And I reckon if, again, if they would have tried to do it by hand, I think it would have been uh, quite complicated, okay? And also the tournament was quite excited. So this is Barcelona uh, team that became champion that day. And I guess this uh, uh, mask are already familiar forever, okay? So just uh, summing up, the. Uh, the idea here has been to show a, a new application, a, a new implementation in practice where operation research have helped a lot to the decision makers here and trying to deal on how to um, reschedule the leaks. There is um, a lot of talk about uh, fairness uh, nowadays in our area and, and there are different ways to understand what fairness is. Here, as you saw, the idea was trying to balance the resting days and trying to uh, make this as equal as possible for teams facing each other. And even, even though this application was motivated by the pandemic, uh, we believe 
it will actually be uh, uh, used as well right after the pandemic, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, finish. Because I think now the people, and, and more or less same as what Dimitri was uh, commenting, like people saw already the benefits of also having this model. So uh, um, even in normal times, it could be interesting to have something like this in place, especially thinking that there are a lot of international matches uh, uh, in between league matches. So for some teams, this idea of uh, resting, even when there are weekend weekend matches for league, is something important if they also have to play an international match in uh, with in in midweek days. Okay, and just from a research point of view, as I say, we solve first the uh, scheduling problem of uh, matches to round, and then we do. Given that solution is there, we we schedule two exact days. Well, uh, 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 of course, an interesting approach to do something uh, in future is trying to approach this problem simultaneously because, of course, they are related uh, uh, with each other. Uh, and therefore, that could be something uh, interesting uh, to do afterwards. I'm reaching my time. Fritz, thanks a lot. And yes, now it's time for questions. Well, okay. Okay, Mario, thank you very much. It's nice to see how you, uh, how you and your team sort of uh, reacted to the, to the COVID-19 restrictions and, uh, and uh, obtained insights that you can use even after that. So that's, uh, that's really cool to hear. Um, okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, so there's one thing that I sort of miss after the presentation, which is a round of applause that shows our appreciation for all the speakers so perhaps i'm alone perhaps not but at least i'm going to applaud for all the speakers because i thoroughly enjoyed them thank you